Hi, Erica. Hi, Bob. How are you? Good. How are you today? I can't complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Erica Chenoweth, a political scientist. Uh, you're a professor at the University of Denver. Uh, and to put a finer point on it, you are professor and associate dean for research at the Joseph Corbell. Is that the way you pronounce Corbell? It is. Well, congratulations to me. School of International Studies at the University of Denver. And you're co-author of this very interesting book that Columbia University Press published, Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict. Now, the word resistance has been uh, much in the air in the United States. People, Some people think of themselves as being part of a resistance against Donald Trump. Um, I should say that this is not a very close analogy to the kinds of resistance that you generally Study. I mean, you you have focused, uh, I think, on uh, you know resistance in more authoritarian societies than ours. I guess is that safe to say, by and large. Generally, the types of campaigns I've studied are those that are trying to overthrow a dictator or mm -hmm. um, trying to create territorial independence, mm -hmm. either against a colonial power or through territorial secession okay. or self-determination. So in that sense, uh, these are kind of different kettles of fish. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I, I think there's some relevance here because for one thing, there are people who, who fear that uh, Donald Trump will become more authoritarian, uh, say in the wake of a terrorist attack, might try to suspend civil liberties or something. And there are people who would say that, say, the, re the reaction to the travel ban was a successful nonviolent resistance to an attempted imposition of executive authority of, of a certain kind. And I want to, later in our conversation, talk about that kind of thing and whether any of the nuts and bolts of what happened there do have something in common with the nuts and bolts of the kinds of uh, things you study. So I want to get back to Trump, but first I want to get clear on exactly the kind of thing you've studied and and what your, your kind of key... Uh, finding is. I, I guess one, one way to summarize your key finding is that nonviolence is more effective than you might think as a way to change things dramatically. Is that right? It's sort of right. So let me qualify it a little bit. Um, nonviolence as a concept actually has a lot of different um, kind of connotations. Uh, some people think of nonviolence as primarily a set of principles about the way one struggles in the world um, or a commitment to a moral philosophy of pacifism. Um, and others kind of think of it as more passive resistance. Um, that is a way to sort of put oneself in a position of moral superiority so as to create a moral dilemma in the opponent and cause them to essentially convert. Um, now, some others uh, use a concept that's closer to what Maria and I studied in our book um, called strategic nonviolence, or what I refer to as nonviolent resistance or civil resistance. And what that um, particular concept deals with um, is the notion that um, people that rely on techniques of resistance that don't physically harm the opponent or threaten to physically harm the opponent um, can be categorized as nonviolent. And that when people rely on those types of techniques of resistance, um, whether or not they have a moral commitment to pacifism or kind of a, a moral commitment to nonviolence per se, um, that the accumulation of those nonviolent techniques um, activates a number of different political dynamics in a society that then makes them more likely to succeed. So it's much less about the moral commitment and more about kind of the strategic and political dynamics that are made possible by the use of nonviolent as opposed to violent resistance. Okay. So, um, so, so there's so a sufficiently skillful deployment of nonviolent tactics can be very effective. Is is your that's exactly right? Yeah, and they you know they're not mutually exclusive. Like some people that use nonviolent resistance are pacifists, mm -hmm. but most aren't. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in our research, we make no assumption that this is kind of a moral fight um, because, you know, if you kind of decide that the basis of the fight is a purely moral one, then you have to assume that the opponent is going to play in the same moral game uh, as the resistance. And 
um, you know, just observably, we didn't feel like we should make that assumption at the outset. Okay. So let's talk about some actual case studies. Um, in your in your book, you focus uh, on on several pretty well known cases, I guess. The the, uh, the the transition of power in Iran around 1979, when the Shah of Iran was deposed, um, the deposing of Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines some years later. Um, you also pay attention to the Palestinian Intifada, the first Intifada in the late 1980s, uh, which I think now now you you categorize that as a success of a kind, or. It, that is a that is a straightforward failure that accomplished. Yeah, we we basically counted it as a failure um, when it boils down to the way we coded it. But we did talk about the fact that the the nonviolent component of the first intifada um, propelled Palestinian self determination farther than it had ever been before uh, in the process that kind of culminated in Oslo, um, and of course since then has not been fully realized, but. But uh, but there you know it sort of gave the best prospects um, for self determination that 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 particular national struggle has experienced. Okay, um, and I guess you you've got kind of two two sets of findings in a certain sense, right? That that uh, one we talked about how how skillful nonviolent tactics can be very successful, but also you talk a little about the downside of violent resistance, right? Mm -hmm. Violent resistance. I mean, we should say at the outset that you have an actual quantitative finding that, that, that goes well beyond these several in-depth case studies, mm -hmm. with a much larger database, and your argument there is that, you know, whatever civil resistance, nonviolent resistance actually works better than violent resistance. Is that too simple a way to put it? Yeah, the, the track record from 1900 to 2006 of campaigns of the type that we've discussed um, is that the nonviolent ones have succeeded twice as often as their violent counterparts. Mm -hmm. And the successes that they've experienced translated into longer term political reforms in those countries where they um, had existed um, that translated into greater political freedoms for the population and a lower probability of, of return to civil conflict. In the, in the longer term. So there are sort of short and long term implications. And, you know, a, a secondary finding is simply that um, that these proportions kind of hold up, even if you control for or account for a variety of different factors that might influence whether these movements succeed or not, mm -hmm. which is a really important thing to add. Um, it's not just that these nonviolent campaigns are setting on in places where it's easier to fight or something. Um, it's that in spite of very adverse conditions, they were able to figure out a way to succeed because of the, the different dynamics that are available to nonviolent campaigns. So, for example, um, the, the, the core reason why we see these campaigns succeeding so often is because they're much better at eliciting large and diverse participation from the population. And so the more inclusive a resistance campaign is, that is, the more types of people who can cooperate um, in the resistance, the more likely it is to create, um, you know, kind of <laughs> problems for uh, the opponent's pillars of support, the civilian bureaucrats, mm -hmm. the economic elites, the security forces, the police, the state media, religious and cultural authorities, all of them start to feel kind of a dilemma, um, not necessarily because their hearts are melting, but because they can see that their own future um, starts to be tied to the future of the resistance rather than the future of the opponent. Mm -hmm. The larger the campaign is, the more likely it is that those people start to question where their where their own interests actually lie. And you found you found that there's a kind of a quantitative threshold at which the movement has like a, a, a better than fifty percent chance of succeeding, right? What it's like what, three, four, five percent of the population has to be part of the resistance? Yeah, we didn't observe any cases that failed after three and a half percent popular mobilization. And, and what is and, and what is the definition of involvement? Does that mean three and a half percent of the population is out on the streets at some point? Yeah, exactly. That's a lot of people. It's I mean, a that, huge number. Do you, was there an estimate for how many people were at protests? Uh, well, there have been, there have been a couple of protests. I mean, there was the women's march, there was the, there were the travel ban protests. What's the largest number that, that have, in the United States, in in the Trump era, that have 
taken to the streets on the same day. Do you have a ballpark figure? I do, believe it or not, Bob. <laughs> I'm not surprised. You're, you are exactly the person I would expect to have that. So uh, the best estimate that I and my colleague Jeremy Pressman could come up with is $4.2 million. Um, and that was which one? Women's March. The Women's March. And that that's... Um, so 3.5% of the U.S. population right now is like 11, a little over 11 million people. Uh-huh. And do you uh, have any idea what the number was for the travel ban? I mean, the travel ban was kind of amazing because it was totally spontaneous. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, do you have any idea what, what the number I think that was, what, a couple hundred thousand maybe? Or? Yeah, it was probably like 120,000 around there, were which you, is a very large number for a spontaneously organized day. Yeah, were you surprised at how skillful that was? I mean, it was like they maintained, you know, it was peaceful, They, 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 they and yet they engaged in specific tactics that were effective. They, 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 you know, they blocked some actions that people wanted to take at particular airports. Were, were you surprised that, that something that unplanned worked that well? Um, I was surprised in the sense that we didn't hear more disaster stories, you know, where things really went off the rails at any of these particular protests. I mean, there were definitely arrests. There were people that were kind of dragged out of um, different blockades that they'd set up and and so forth. But um, that's just direct action. That's what happens when people engage in in civil disobedience. Um, There was no incident of kind of mass violence. In fact, at the at the Women's March, it's um, you know, if you think about 4.2 million people doing anything collectively together on a on a given day, the fact that there were no high profile arrests, <laughs> even, um, is just like a stunning, like, uh, thing that it, it's like never observed. <laughs> yeah. You know, so so there there's something that's happening where um, you know people are sort of, in a way, it feels um, moving to this kind of natural capacity that we all seem to have for collective action and there seems to be this intuition that um that people need to do this in a way that's sustainable and so there's an imposition of self-discipline i think that's actually gonna Mm -hmm. um make it much easier for this this movement to be a movement as opposed to just these moments of improvised resistance now i mentioned that there might be some parallels between uh you know what's happened in in the uh, the brief history of the Trump administration, and uh, forms of resistance in these uh, more authoritarian societies. And one thing I had in mind was the response of the courts. Now the courts ruled basically on the side of the protesters, and my guess is that the protests may have increased the chances of that happening. Uh, it's hard to say because judges aren't supposed to admit that they're responsive to popular pressure, but that seems to me a not crazy thing at all. Is, is it? Is it your observation that in the kinds of societies you've studied, this is sometimes like a really important chain in the feedback that, because a lot of these societies actually have court systems that are not entirely dictated by by the leader, right? And they have, the, and they can go one way or the other. Is that an important thing? Absolutely. I mean, the, the pillars of support that are going to be meaningful in different societies are quite varied, you know, based on whatever the institutional structure is and and how you know loyal they've been in the past and so forth. But in the United States, I mean, um, I've been reading up a little bit on my American politics literature, and and the, the the broad ranging consensus is that judicial independence is kind of a myth. You know, that the judiciary is strongly influenced um, by by popular sentiment and and the the, the feelings of the day and. And, and the emergence of new norms and the way that those norms are um, activated and promoted and, and lobbied uh, by different interest groups. So, so I, I think that the, in this country, the judiciary is an extremely important pillar um, that is absolutely susceptible to popular pressure and, and that it's not an accident that we saw um, the outcomes that we saw in the, in the particular districts in mm-hmm. which they were decided. Mm-hmm. Okay, now... To get a, a, a sense for how much you think is possible through uh, through through civil resistance, um, the case of Syria. Now, I have personally been opposed to the arming of the rebels, uh, 
But it isn't because I thought that they that, that the resistance movement would have succeeded in the absence of arms. It's just that I thought the outcome would have been less horrendous. I, I, I thought, you know, you would have a brutal suppression. Thousands of people would die. That's better than hundreds of thousands of people dying and millions of refugees. But it, it is... Is your sense that even in cases like that, with a pretty ruthless leader, that, that you'd, you know, I'd be surprised at how much is possible through nonviolent resistance? Well, I think one of the one of the most interesting phenomena about this topic is how often people are surprised <laughs> and then they sort of re-narrate uh, the story about how bad the regime really was, you know, and if nonviolent resistance succeeded, then that regime couldn't have really been as bad as we always thought. Hmm. And that that's something that tends to happen, I think, in the wake of a lot of these movements, Tunisia, Egypt, um, that was definitely part of the story, you know, like even um, Tunisia was the first country to, to start to experience the rumblings of the Arab awakening and, you know, a lot of Egyptolo Egyptologists were saying, well, this will never spread to Egypt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember standing in the lunch line um, at my old university with uh, one of the world's foremost Syria experts who was standing behind me. And I said, what do you think? Is this going to spread to Syria? And he said, there's no way. And there's, you know, nobody will ever protest in Syria. Mm -hmm. That was like in um, like March 1st of 2011 or something. So there's always this sense that it's impossible and then once it starts, and then especially once it succeeds, there's this looking backward and thinking, well, it was inevitable. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the structure, of course it was going to happen. And, you know, um, there's a lot of cases, um, Iran even uh, was a really hor horrendous case. The Iranian Revolution, there, there were thousands of people killed in the streets um, during that uprising. It succeeded in the end. Um, and I think that there is... Um, you know, I, I think that there are probably cases where nonviolent resistance isn't effective, and in those same cases, probably violent resistance isn't effective either. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, it's not for me to sort of lay out the the criteria where I think it's impossible because I, I'm not sure we can observe that. But I also think, um, you know, there are good moral reasons not to try to do that mm -hmm. as well. Um, but, but you know, in, in the case of Syria, the, the tragedy to me is that nonviolent resistance was working. You think was, so? You think it really was working? Yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of the dynamics that we observe in other cases that eventually succeed were underway there. So we had, you know, huge popular participation. We had people withstanding massive amounts of very selective and very brutal types of repression with discipline. <laughs> Um, we had the beginnings of a coherent organization, although they were sort of starting with very little in that regard, and so it was taking time, mm -hmm. which is normal. It's normal um, for lots of cases. And then uh, we had the, the beginnings of different techniques of nonviolent action that were being experimented with. So, for example, there was an attempt at a general strike in July of 2011 that didn't actually catch fire, but, you know, was tried and they learned a lot from it. Mm -hmm. And it was also right around that time that you started to see the, the emergence of the, the armed groups, which kind of then curtailed, I think, a lot of the progress in implementing the lessons that were learned about how to coordinate a strike. And these were, I gather, truly indigenous groups. They were Syrian groups, yeah. but they were, even then, were they getting the arms from outside, from neighboring yeah. Sunni states? Not yet. So, so most of the, my, my read on this is that you had mostly local groups, you know, the local coordination councils and, and just, you know, unnamed groups of people that were organizing, um, that were trying to get a handle on things, that were trying to communicate with one another across the country, which is very difficult um, without being detected, that were starting to experience really brutal levels of violence, um, kind of paramilitary or death squad type stuff that was mm -hmm. nasty, but they but it was backfiring, and more and more people were turning out um, for these demonstrations. The largest demonstration was on July 11th of 2011. They had like a million people uh, mobilized. Really, and then and then there was um, there there was an attempt uh, a couple of weeks after that to to try to have the strike, and it it was difficult to succeed in part because it didn't reach Damascus, which is like a stronghold. But the other thing that was happening is that they were getting these mass defections from the you know largely Sunni conscripts into the mm 
into the army that that were refusing to leave the barracks. And in fact, that precipitated a change in strategy by Assad uh, to keep, you know, the the security forces in the barracks and to send out the air force instead because he felt they were more loyal and. Whatever. So, so there, you know, we, we were observing a lot of the dynamics that we often observe in successful campaigns. But the, the issue was it was basically, in my mind, cut short by the international dynamics. So you rightly mentioned, you know, regional powers starting to push weapons in to the defectors that unfortunately, when they defected, went into Turkey and took their weapons with them. Um, Turkey granted sanctuary to the Free Syrian Army at the end of July of 2011, which I think was the, the turning point in the conflict, because they now had a place they could hold up and safely plot and and uh, commit armed attacks over the border without um, fear of retribution. Meanwhile, uh, there's a whole host of international actors, you know, pushing for the escalation of this conflict a la the Libya model, which, you know, I heard that phrase all the time, um, where there were kind of exiles, uh, Syrian exiles, but also others, um, just kind of liberal hawk types that were really pushing for a Libya-like intervention, um, which, of course, then just totally changes the incentive structure. Um, You have people sending money to armed groups. You also then have Russia and Iran coming in at the aid of Assad, so escalating the conflict on that side. And then you have, you know, this um, these sort of calls for higher risk armed actions by the Free Syrian Army in anticipation of provoking an international intervention. Mm-hmm. So I think my in my mind, um, you know, the, the success of the nonviolent resistance such as it was, was undermined by the behavior of international actors with very little understanding about these dynamics and and how to minimize civilian and humanitarian <laughs> crises in a, in a context like this. Yeah, and initially it was some of the Sunni states. I, I guess it was America a little late to the game in terms of actually providing arms. Uh, I mean, they, they, the first round of arms that none of that came from America, right? Correct. There there was a there was a how would you call it kind of slow escalation over about four mm-hmm. years of U.S. involvement. Um, and initially, the United States um, came out, obviously, in support of the Syrian opposition, but co- uh, conditioned that on um, it being the nonviolent opposition. And in fact, the United States did provide some support and try to help coordinate the Syrian opposition at that mm-hmm. time um, by largely convening different members from around the country of the movement and trying to get them to work together and providing them a little bit of equipment here and there, like, you know, phones and computers and stuff. But basically, um, then there was, you know, this conversation about needing to give them more that they could protect themselves with. And so there was a decision that that could include arms. But really, we ended up, the United States just ended up sending um, mostly defensive um, materials. So like vests and, you know, armor and stuff, Mm -hmm. um, non-lethal aid. And then it took us another couple years to start really pushing in lethal aid. So, okay. And did I correctly understand you to suggest a couple of minutes ago that kind of the discourse in the United States influenced the the flow of arms in a certain sense? In other words, the more some more regime change talk there was in the United States, the uh, the more uh, the more Sunni states were inclined to lean in, or did did I misunderstand that? I think there were a couple of discourses that had an impact. Um, one of them was the um, triumphalism around Libya. Mm-hmm. Before, um, before the, after the initial part of the intervention, uh, which just remind people, initially what the UN seemed to authorize was uh, the Security Council was a real, you would think a kind of limited operation to protect a specific civilian population. I mean, at least there was a particular crisis uh, and so there was that intervention. It morphed into something that certainly hadn't been explicit in the UN resolution, which is a regime change operation, in effect. And there was a there was a point in between, you know, before all hell break loose, when Libya was thought of as a very successful uh, mm-hmm. intervention. Right? Exactly, yeah. because it because the the people that everyone was afraid uh, would be slaughtered by Gaddafi were protected. Qaddafi's forces 
you know, were rolled back fairly easily over the course of a couple of months. The intervention was multilateral. It was legal in the sense of the United Nations yeah. Security Council approving it and um, under R2P. And then the Russians and Chinese basically felt totally burned. And so they, because we exceeded the UN mandate by turning it into a regime change operation. Exactly. And so basically, uh, you know, the, the long term implication of, of that operation was that it killed the use of R2P, at least through which the is U.S. right Council. to protect, which is a doctrine that's kind of evolved in the U.N. It, it's in other words, it's a right to intervene. Originally, the U.N. was set up more to prevent uh, war between nations, transborder aggression. Right to protect is something that's evolved more recently, as I understand it, a doctrine that, that uh, justifies intervention to protect the people within a country if, if it's authorized uh, by the Security Council, then it's a legal intervention. Right. The, the responsibility to protect doctrine, which, which actually there are other elements of it as well related to prevention of, of conflict and, and things, but, but mm -hmm. there is one particular element of it that, that allows the United Nations under a Security Council resolution um, to intervene for humanitarian purposes. And in this case, the Russia and China veto players on the UN Security Council um, decided that we had exceeded the mandate and that they were never again going to be duped, basically, right? So that helps to understand the context um, of the Syrian conflict where you have a lot of different um, people kind of calling for a Libya-like intervention. Uh, and you see very early on that Russia and China are opposed to any kind of multilateral legal military intervention directly. But the other discourse that was happening in the, in the United States at the time was actually a, more of a, a kind of false optimism that Assad was going to fall like mm -hmm. any day, right? So, so actually the United States didn't really develop a coherent, serious strategy other than coming out and saying, yes, we want Assad to go, and yes, we support the nonviolent opposition, and they have a right to determine their own future. Um, and because uh, the United States government was overly optimistic about Assad's prospects for kind of regaining control, um, I think that uh, it really, you know, delayed uh, any type of forward thinking about what might happen uh, and what the United States needed to be thinking about two, year, two or three years down the line, particularly the refugee crisis and the humanitarian catastrophe. Because at but, that point, uh, I mean, it wasn't just Libya. The Tunisia thing had gone, you know, pretty well. Uh, and and so where and at, where were we in Egypt at that point? Was that like after the successful overthrow of Morsi and before things uh, turned with the coup? No, we were still uh, we were still in. in so Morsi was was still in power. well. Morsi was in power. Okay. And, so Morsi was overthrown in 2013. Okay. Um, so that that was the same the 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 summer of 2013 is when you know things started to go off the rails big time with a lot of the the, the countries that had had the 2011 uprising. So you had the Tamarad movement take Morsi out, and then you also had um, the first chem you, you know the chemical weapons um, mm -hmm. attack. Uh, that then precipitated the United States into a conversation mm -hmm. about whether we're going to. Uh, uh, by the way, I misspoke. I meant Mubarak, not Morsi. So that confused, oh, yeah. that confused everything. Okay, but but, okay. but, but yeah. Morsi Sparks was out. Morsi was in power, meaning that the, there had been a successful resolution and it hadn't gone bad yet. Is that right? There hadn't yeah, been I mean, a coup. It, yeah. So so Mubarak was out as of February 2011. Okay. Morsi okay. was in, um, but uh, at the time that the the Syrian um, uprising was okay. taking place. Yeah. So, so anyway, so I remember when when Obama said Assad must go, it did almost seem like there was a force of nature that would ensure that the way things had been going, right? Yeah. It just seemed like, yeah, well, you, all he has to do is really say it, and that'll tip the balance, you know. But in retrospect, obviously, uh, he hadn't kind of thought it through, I guess. Um, but at that point, the wind still seemed to largely be uh, blowing the right way. Uh, but in any event. Uh, basically, over time, the influx of arms ended uh, an experiment that you would have liked to have seen completed, which is to see whether uh, civil resistance could have done the job you think maybe it well could have. I mean, a million people is a lot. They were out on the streets on one day, a million people? 
Because mm-hmm. that's what percentage is the Syrian population? Uh, well, there's like 30 million there. Okay. So. so that's close to your, your, your threshold, where you're getting to a point where typically mm-hmm. uh, it works, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it, it, you know, it's, it's, a, um, it's a totally tragic case because if you sort of think about um, the incentives that were set up by actors that were outside of the context of the country, um, and then the differences that um, the people inside were trying to realize um, from what the external actors were trying to provoke there. Um, that, and, you know, the, the big tragedy is that the, the people inside couldn't basically decide what the external actors were doing. Um, so there, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a cautionary tale and trying to make more of an effort early on in a conflict to understand exactly what people are asking for domestically. Um, because they're the ones that are going to bear all the costs. Um, and the people outside that are calling for the risky action don't bear any of the costs. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there were a few Syrians inside saying, yeah, please give us arms, right? I mean, there, it, wasn't in, it wasn't entirely imposed from the outside. At the same time, if there hadn't been the influx of arms, we'd be in a very different world of some sort. I think I think there's also the the question always of you know who's asking for arms and why like maybe maybe you think about <laughs> like in a context like this where you have a million people um, engaging in nonviolent resistance on a Wednesday and then you have like a handful of you know maybe a thousand of them saying give us weapons is it really a good idea to listen to a thousand people saying give us weapons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you have to wonder about the motives of some of the people who gave them weapons. I mean, I don't want to get too cynical, but I, I imagine there are rulers in that area who would really hate to see nonviolent resistance succeed in the area, right? I mean, they find that very oh, yeah. threatening. Um, well, there's no doubt. I mean, there's no doubt that all of the different actors that intervened had their own interests at stake and, and were trying to influence the conflict in the direction that would benefit them the most. And they didn't actually care about the civilian price, mm-hmm. um, as evidenced by the fact that they don't care about them now, <laughs> right? So they're, they're not willing to take refugees or anything like that um, around the region and most of the countries that have been most responsible for sending uh, guns and money in there. Mm-hmm. So Egypt was for a time a, su- a success story, and... Uh and it does seem in retrospect that it was probably a slightly easier case than Syria. There was uh, more in the way of, um, I mean, they, they had something closer to real elections there all along, didn't they? Uh, and so on. But, but, uh, but nonetheless, it, you wouldn't have predicted, you wouldn't have predicted that it would happen as easily as it did. Uh, and then, of course, something uh, you know went wrong. Uh, I mean, I mean, after the actual success, you had a you had a democratically elected uh, leader, uh, who you know, in some sense was associated with the resistance, um, who was deposed by a coup by a uh, a ruler who has shown, I think, more brutality than any previous Egyptian ruler in modern history. Is there a, is there a lesson there about any any lesson in Egypt? Well, what interests you most about it, either in terms of what the ingredients for initial success were, or about what the cautionary tale is about the aftermath? Mm-hmm. Well, so I think about um, Tunisia as an interesting comparative example here too, because there are a couple things that that went differently uh, in the two cases that I think are really instructive. So first of all, in Tunisia. Um, The resistance itself, um, well, first of all, it was the first country to experience resistance, which is, that's always what you want (laughs) to be. It's, it's, you never want to be number seven, like in the revolutionary way. Why, why is that? Um, basically because the, the lower, the, the later you are to start, the more your opponent has anticipated and learned the lessons of brutality to, to suppress you. Um, but the other issue is just that, um, you know, a lot of times later down the line, um, the, the movements that emerge are more improvisational, like they're trying to follow the leader from other countries and import lessons from what they observe in other countries into their own context and they don't fit. So for example, um, 
you know, if you're in Syria in March of 2011 and you see Tunisia and then Egypt and then Yemen and, and it's just spreading, um, what you might be inclined to see is that 17 days of protest in the streets brought down Mubarak, um, as opposed to, wow, they did like 10 years of organizing. Right. And then they had this kind of pinnacle um, of protest that tipped the balance in a way, or like convened all the people at, at one place and created mass. So in the Egypt case, compared to Tunisia, there are a couple things that, that came out. The first is that you know, Tunisia had a very inclusive constitutional process um, leading to you know, the elections and um, they they were able to, um, you know, kind of consolidate uh, in a way that Egypt wasn't, in part because while the uprising in Egypt was incredibly inclusive, the, the transition process was not. It was pretty exclusive. So the, the best organized groups were like the Muslim Brotherhood and the army. And so it's not surprising that we saw those two groups duking it out over the next couple of years and ultimately the army winning because it had the most entrenched authorities in the country and um, was able to sort of make appeals both on the basis of restoring law and order, um, which Morsi had a tough time with, but, but also um, basically, uh, you know, appealing to nationalist sentiments. Like, you know, that I think there was an, an understanding in the United States that, that Egyptian liberals were really Egyptian liberals, where actually they were more Egyptian nationalists and um, were more concerned with, with maintaining a, a sort of secular uh, system that, um, um, you know, kept the Islamists at bay. Yeah, they were fairly secular. And, 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 and I think in a way viewed uh, the Muslim Brotherhood somewhat the way some American liberals view the, the religious right, right? Um, yeah. the, uh, was the... Was the uh, because the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, that that was the uh, Morsi was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, and, and he was the one who was deposed by the coup, the army-sponsored coup. Um, the uh, do you? I, I, this isn't your line of work, but I've always wondered. I mean, this isn't part of your specialty, but I've always wondered whether you, the United States had a chance to intervene and head off the coup. Like, presumably, they had inklings, and if they had said to, to um, General Sisi, look, we will publicly oppose this and cut off all future aid. Uh, I, I, I don't know what would have happened, but, but apparently we didn't do that. Is there, much, is, there, is there discussion in political science about that hypothetical? I have no doubt there is. I'm, I'm not yeah, super not familiar with it, but, but I, I will say that um, it wasn't surprising <laughs> to even me. I'm not an expert in Egypt or in um, you know, military regimes, but um, but it wasn't surprising part because I, you know, was in touch with um, some activists from time to time who were liberal activists in Egypt who were like excited about the prospects of a coup <laughs> mm -hmm. in like February of 2013. So pretty, pretty early on, um, where there were kind of talks between different um, military leaders and and their family members about, you know, if there's a coup, do you think people will come into the streets and support it? And, you know, the answer was, yes, I think, I think they would. And so there was this like buildup of it. Mm -hmm. um, it was not very thinly veiled popular coup. Right. And then there was resistance to the coup, but uh, CC reacted with just extreme brutality. I mean, on a single occasion, they gunned down hundreds of yeah. uh, peaceful Muslim protesters. Brotherhood. Yeah. And that was pretty much the end of it, right? Um, not exactly. I mean, there's, there remains resistance there, I think. Um, and I think that the, um, the, the sit-in certainly ended, um, during that one day in August of 2013, when, um, when the army went in and just, you know, broke it up. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I think that the resistance largely has gone underground there and, um, that doesn't mean it's gone. It's just in a different kind of phase of regrouping. Um, but my sense is that, you know, right now there's there are protests over food prices in Egypt and that kind of thing can can really build up into um, calls for the removal of a leader and, and things like that very easily, especially if the if the um, 
army overreacts or the the police overreact um, to a given incident, and it's widely viewed as illegitimate by the population. Mm -hmm. Um, So are there any general takeaways about how the U.S. should respond to, you know, uh, countries in which there are resistance movements? Um, I mean, we have... some degree of institutional involvement sometimes, right? I mean, we have the, uh, what's the, there's an actual government thing that has, a U.S. government thing that has democracy in the, in the, in the title or something that gets involved in these, right? Uh, the U.S. government. Are you, do you mean the National Endowment for Democracy? Yeah, yeah, I guess National Endowment for Democracy sometimes gets, gets out and helps these groups do various things, right? Uh, well, I mean, so NED and IRI and, and groups like that um, are often have a presence in, in various countries where they're trying to encourage political development, political party capacity, and things like that. And sometimes, you know, they're kind of tapped as, um, you know, the organizers or the, the catalysts for the, these resistance movements. But in my experience... Um, you know, most of the campaigns that we study that succeed in the end anyway are are totally locally oriented, um, deliberately and, and necessarily, um, because the entire basis of their power potential inheres in their ability to elicit large and diverse participation from their societies. And that's hard to get if there's a sense that this is a foreign conspiracy. Right. And it's also really difficult... Um, to maintain if there's some truth to the government's propaganda that this is a foreign conspiracy, which almost all of them accuse these movements of, whether it's, you know, there, there's a grain of truth in it or not. And so actually, um, to your question, uh, Maria, Stefan, and I are, are undertaking a study right now where we're trying to better understand the different types of external support that have been used um, to support nonviolent movements in other countries, but also the different types of supporters so it's not always like the U.S. government, nor should it necessarily be. There are transnational solidarity networks. Um, there's kind of civilian to civilian interaction, track two diplomacy type stuff. Um, there's also, um, you know, media uh, support that can be really influential um, in, in calling attention to a particular mm-hmm. situation. Um, there's NGOs and INGOs. So, so what we're trying to do is kind of make a, um, a database of all of the different interactions between external supporters and nonviolent movements since 2000. Mm-hmm. We just about wrapped up the database. And, and one of the key questions we'll be asking is, you know, which types of supporters and which type of support help these campaigns more than they hurt them mm-hmm. <laughs> or undermine their domestic legitimacy? And also we're very interested in understanding the timing of support. So is support by an external actor more important in creating an enabling environment for civil society to flourish on its own? Or is it more important, like, say, at the peak of a campaign, when Mm -hmm. people are already fully mobilized and you can make a statement in support of them or or something along those lines? Or is it most influential in the aftermath of a campaign, where the skill set shifts entirely to trying to bargain between a huge, diverse set of actors that have been involved in this coalition mm-hmm. that now have to kind of navigate the politics of of um, living and working together in a, in a totally different scene mm-hmm. um, without, you know, um, devolving into either a worse civil conflict or um, kind of backsliding into authoritarianism. So, so these are all like open questions that, um, believe it or not, haven't really been empirically dealt with before. Okay. It sounds like there is cause for the United States to perhaps be careful about how, uh, to the extent to which it offers assistance or how conspicuously it does or the forms in which it does, because the uh, regimes play on any sense of foreign involvement. You know, there was a famous case in the Ukraine where I forget the name of the woman at the State Department who was having a conversation, I guess, with the ambassador, and the Russians tapped the phone, and, you know, look. It sounded like we were sitting there deciding who the next leader of Ukraine was going to be. And in fact, the guy they they named became the next leader, didn't he? Yeah, Uh, that was Victoria Newland. Victoria Newland. Yeah. Uh, uh, And and, and I got to think that hurts our our cause. Um, 
right? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so there are a couple a couple layers to that. On the one hand, you know, you know the the idea that that the United States and its European counterparts were conspiring to install the leader that they wanted is one thing. Um, you know, that, and that happens, and it happens in Russia, it happens everywhere. Right. Um, that doesn't mean that we can affect those changes um, and have any capacity to do so. Sometimes it just so happens that the person that Victoria Nuland would have tapped is the person mm-hmm. that the Ukrainian people also would have tapped, right? Um, but, but I think that it's... Um, I think that it does look bad. Um, certainly from the Russian perspective, it made them dig in their heels even further, both in Ukraine and in Syria. Um, the, the Russian government is thoroughly convinced that any time you see popular protests, it is a conspiracy of the United States government. They're just totally convinced. So you think, they you think Putin the- himself actually believes that? Because yeah. he would use it as a rhetorical you know, theme regardless, but... You think he no, believes it? You, I see, you see the same thing in Turkey. It's a common thing. Erdogan says the same thing, uh, yeah. but but you think Putin actually believes it? I think he totally. But I think he does. I think he looks around at all of his friends. <laughs> He's like looking at you know Venezuela, Syria, Iran, Kyrgyzstan. I mean, you name the country um, that he considers uh, it, a country in his orbit. And they're facing a domestic uprising at some point in the last 10 years. Now, there are other reasons why that is taking place. One is that people don't want to live in these types of regimes, and they're using popular protests to try to shake it off. Mm-hmm. But, um, but in his mind, uh, the United States has been basically using this to stoke unrest in countries mm-hmm. in his orbit. And, you know, there have been cases, unfortunately, like the Newland case in, in Ukraine, um, that provides some evidentiary support for his concerns, um, and that you know he and and uh, and many other leaders of of these other governments that I've just mentioned have had very open conversations about the fact that they view this as part of the United States strategy. They call them soft coups mm-hmm. or color revolutions, and they they think that it's been a concerted strategy, particularly by the United States intelligence community. Um, to to provoke these these uprisings, so it's it's like explicit, um, and and the Russian national security strategies that they released the last and I think 2016 was their last one. They come out very openly saying they reject this as a practice, and they they will do anything they can to restore the primacy of sovereignty mm-hmm. um, to the international order because they think this is really dangerous and unwise. Mm-hmm. Um, to provoke this kind of unrest in other countries, and if if the United States does it to them, they'll do it to the United States allies. So that mm-hmm. that explains the the sort of hybrid warfare approach to Eastern Europe and the Baltics right mm-hmm. now, and the Balkans, and places where he can he thinks he can impose a wedge and create unrest using, in his mind, the same tools that the United States has used against his satellites. Okay. Now, I know you got to go in a few minutes, but I guess the final question is, like, back to the so-called resistance in America uh, against Trump. Is, is uh, <clears throat> what's your view uh, of, well, kind of of the use of that term? Uh, in other words, clearly it's not parallel to the cases we've been talking about in terms of, of you know, how authoritarian the government is. But uh, do you think, you know, do you tend to view some of this through the prism of your own work, uh, of some of what's going on in America in terms of, of protest? And in particular, do you think it's um, do you think it's crazy to think that in the wake of a terrorist incident, uh, President Trump could try to crack down, suspend civil liberties, whatever, round up Muslims, who knows, uh, in a way that would uh, make the situation here a little more analogous to what you're used to studying? Well, to answer your second question first, I think that uh, democracies always require an extremely robust and engaged citizenry in order to remain democracies. And that's true no matter who is in power. Um, And it's especially true in periods where um, there are authoritarian currents um, that happen to find themselves in elected office and in control of all three bodies of government, which mm-hmm. is basically where we're at. So, uh, so that, that's one issue. The, the second issue about whether there are analogies or lessons that can be learned. I mean, the thing about, the, the nice thing about studying nonviolent resistance 
in dictatorships and in um, territorial independence movements is that we, we picked those cases deliberately because they were thought to be the hardest cases for these campaigns to succeed. And so, you know, if there are lessons that can be learned from them um, that can be applied in cases where there are more freedoms of association and freedoms of speech that people enjoy right now, um, then we should expect those lessons to be easily translatable. And really, I'll just say, like, the, the four things that the campaigns that succeed in these um, really difficult situations do is that first, they, um, they get the large and diverse participation. Mm -hmm. Second, they, they switch up techniques, so they're not always protesting or petitioning or um, striking. They're doing lots of different things that are sort of sequenced in a way that continually puts pressure on the site of oppression in order to um, dismantle it or transform it. The, the third thing they do is they remain resilient even when repression escalates against them. So meaning they have a plan and they've sort of figured out a way to, to prepare for the repression, they expect it, and they remain disciplined to stick to their plan even when it starts. And then the, the fourth thing they do is they elicit defections or loyalty shifts from within the opponent's pillars of support. So in this case, this would mean like getting a bunch of you know Congress people um, who are in the GOP to start coming out more openly and resisting um, the Trump agenda in Congress. Um, it could mean, um, you know, police that refuse to crack down in certain ways or like deportation officials who refuse to comply with with orders they think are unjust or excessive or disproportional. Um, so there are lots of ways we can imagine this taking place in, in the U.S. And I, I would argue that many of those have already started, as you mentioned, the courts, for example. Um, so... So I think I think that there are lots of ways that that the lessons from um, from the hundreds of other countries uh, that I've studied uh, over you know the last century um, uh, could you know could apply to our case and and there are kind of tried and true methods of of nonviolent resistance that apply absolutely in in the American context today. Okay. Well, I'm glad you did that summary because uh, for elaboration on it, people can turn to your book, Why Civil Resistance Works, which you co-authored. Uh, subtitle is the, the Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict. And you do go into several cases in great detail so that people can see exactly not only what the ingredients of success are of nonviolent resistance, but why violent resistance often runs into problems. Uh, and so... Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll uh, check in with you down the road, I although I hope it won't be because the United States has become more analogous to some of the countries you've studied, but one never knows. So, so, so thanks uh, so much, Erica. Thanks, Bob. Take care. You too.